Okay, brethren, uh, last week we took the time, if you were with us, to look at Psalms number 90. Uh, Psalm 90 is believed to be a psalm of Moses, the man of God. It's often somewhat taken out of context and people refer to the fact the Bible says that we, mankind, have three score years and ten in which to do all of our stuff. As we saw last week, uh, that's not a general statement about all mankind. Psalm 90 is a psalm of Moses given at a specific time in Moses' career. And as we saw last week, it appears to relate to the time when the people of Israel with Moses were under a curse. They had disobeyed God, rebelled against God again and again and again. And God said, that's it, enough, no more. Uh, 40 years and you'll all die. All those of you adults will die. And so people who were 20 at that time died by 60 if not earlier, people who are 30, died at 70, and so on. So we can't take Psalms 90 as some allowance that God gives that we have three score years and ten, and, and, and that's it. Also last week we saw where some people say that Scripture says that there is an appointed time for us to die. <laughs> They're quoting or misquoting Hebrews 9. It doesn't say there's an appointed time for us to die. It says God has appointed that we will die. And after that, the judgment. But the time, it, it can be expanded. We saw several proverbs that say God can add years. And of course, it can be shortened uh, for a whole number of reasons, right? So that's where we were last week. Um, this week, we're going to look at the next psalm, Psalms number 91. And Psalm 91 is a, one of the more popular uh, psalms out there. It's particularly popular among uh, military men. I should say probably American <laughs> military men and perhaps military women, which exist nowadays. I don't think it's probably that popular with British military men because in yeah, Britain no, we, we, don't, we don't do religion, right? But Americans are much more open about uh, the Christian religion. And it does seem uh, from lots of stories that at least American military men uh, do have a sort of a soft spot for Psalms 91. It's often called the Psalm of Protection. We'll see why in a moment. It's called the Soldier's Psalm. Uh, that appears to be because it's so popular among, among the military. Uh, you hear all sorts of stories. Uh, military men in the First World War, Second World War, right up to today, who will memorize the psalm, who will recite it every day as they seek God's protection. Uh, they will often have it on their dog tags. They will have little cards with the, uh, the psalm on it, uh, right? There are anecdotal stories. You can't always you know, vouch for them being entirely accurate of brigades of soldiers in the past who had the psalm on a card, read it every day, and in theory at least, uh, that brigade, that company, went through a war without any casualties. Some of those stories, they might be you know well-meaning but not necessarily 100% accurate. One that is more accurate is... Uh, I think the well-known actor, at least many of us older people, <laughs> would know him, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, if you don't know Jimmy Stewart, he was a famous uh, actor, famous for playing, I forget his name, in the uh, It's a Wonderful World, so black and white movie from back in the 40s or 50s Ooh, like or something. Years ago, 100 years ago. 100 years ago, yeah. But, but uh, <laughs> uh, Jimmy Stewart was a, a fighter pilot in the Second World War, flew many missions over, over Europe. When he went uh, across to Europe to, to, to fly in his plane and so on, his father uh, gave him Psalms 91 and suggested to Jimmy Stewart that he, <laughs> he read it every day. And pretty much he did. Every time Jimmy Stewart went into battle, he took Psalm 91, a little booklet his dad gave him, and he read it and thought about it. And lo and behold, you know, he survived the war, as of course, you know, to be fair, you know, many did. So it's quite a popular psalm particularly because it refers again and again and again to protection and safety, which all of us, of course, you know, various times like the idea of. So we're going to look at Psalms 91. Uh, so you can open your Bibles there and we'll get started. There are, it seems, three parties involved as an experienced person advising a, a student, if you like, how to live, how to acquire protection, that's the two persons, the teacher and the pupil. Then at the end of the psalm, you know, God steps in and we have God's words. 
right? So we'll keep that in mind as we go. So let's read the first uh, eight verses just to get, if you like, uh, an early look at the theme of the psalm. So read Psalms 91 verses 1 through 8. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. I guess nowadays, <laughs> I think we're all more familiar with perilous pestilences than we once were, whether it's uh, you know, the famous COVID-19 or whether it's uh, monkeypox. Or now in this country, we've now got smallpox making a reappearance. And polio. Uh, and, uh, and polio. Verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler, your protection. You shall not be afraid of the terror or terrorist by night, nor of the arrow or missile that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. So I think that gives us a, a good initial insight into the psalm. It's talking about protection and deliverance from pestilence, from the fowler, from the terror or terrorist, from something that lays waste at noonday, where thousands fall on one side and the other. But you, or this person at least, is protected, is safeguarded. So that's why it's a psalm of protection, because the whole psalm is about that. Clearly that's why lots of soldiers, military men, like the idea of reading that before they go into you know, jeopardy and battle and so on, it, it can provide reassurance and comfort so, for them, right? But all of that is contingent on, strangely enough, verse 1, right? Notice verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You have to be somebody who dwells in the secret place. And then you'll be under the shadow of the Almighty, all right? So this is not something that just appears automatically. Well, I believe there is a God. Well, that's good. That's a start. But the blessings that follow are for those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Right? To dwell... Well, you know what to dwell is. To dwell is to reside, to, to abide, to stay, to make your home somewhere. So we're talking here about a person, man or woman, who dwells, resides, abides, has made their home with the Most High and therefore abide under his shadow, right? We're not talking here about somebody, and this is probably, unfortunately, more common, People who visit God, <laughs> visitors, right? There's a difference, doesn't it, between dwelling and visiting, right? Probably most of us at some point in our lives, um, don't be embarrassed, have visited McDonald's, right? Or visited Burger King or Kentucky Fried Chicken or Denny's, right? Or whatever. We visit. You go there, you line up, you get your, your burger, you chomp it, right? Slug your drink and you leave. That's a visit. You're in out and... Well, fast food restaurants, not very long, right? That's a visit. This is not a visitor. <clears throat> this is somebody who dwells, abides, makes their home, resides with the Almighty God, right? So it's somebody who's got a close relationship. Now, many Christians are visitors, right? Uh, they, they visit God when there's an emergency. Uh, they sort of turn about God and bang on his door and say, oh, it's me again. I know I've not seen you for... While. X weeks, months, years, but I've got an emergency. I need your help. As if God's like a vending machine. You, know, you go along and pop in your coin and pull the handle out, pops a solution to your emergency. That's that's not the type of, I mean, God might in his mercy respond, right, 
to an emergency call like that. But that's not what we're talking about. The, the, the person to whom Psalms 91 applies is a person who has a very close, ongoing relationship with God such that they are said to, to dwell and to abide. You know, the, uh, the net translation, I think a New English translation, says of, of this verse, the one who lives in the shelter of the sovereign one and resides in the protective shadow of the mighty king. The one who lives in, resides in the protective sort of shadow, right? And when you look at several psalms, right, uh, you, you find the same sort of thoughts going through many of the psalmists that they, they all talk about dwelling with God, uh, residing with God, uh, abiding with God. It's not just a, a one-off, it's a sort of common theme. Hold your place there. If you've got a marker, leave it in Psalm 91 because we're coming back. But let's look at Psalms 27. Psalms 27. Let's read verses uh, 1 to 5 to start with. <clears throat> the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord, Jehovah, is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And the implication is, well, nobody. Now, Jehovah God is your salvation and your strength. Who are you going to be afraid of? Verse 2. When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So verse 4 says, one thing, there's one thing that's important to me, one thing I've desired and hungered for, which I will seek for, right? That I will seek, I will search it out, I'll look for it, and that is that I might dwell, not visit, but dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now we can't physically do that, but it's talking about this close relationship. We're dwelling, abiding, residing in the secret place of the Most High. Verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. So again, you can see there the, uh, the thought is in the secret place of the Most High. He's hiding me in his pavilion. Right? I'm searching out and seeking this close relationship to dwell with God, and it results in my protection. Therefore, I do not fear. Right? Uh, let's read verses 7 through 10. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, face my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. So you, what you can see there is, is like God saying, seek my face. Search for me, find me, look me out. Verse 8, when you said, O Lord, seek my face, my heart responded to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. And of course, to seek God's face means a pretty close relationship. If, you talk, if you're talking to somebody face to face, <laughs> we use that expression, right? It means you're in front of them. You're not necessarily on the phone uh, on a Zoom call, well, you might nowadays a Zoom call, you can have a video, of course. But, you know, typically when you say face to face, you mean right in front of you. So God says, seek my face. That means get close to me. And then the person responds, I will seek your face. Right. And seek it. All right. Uh, verse nine. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord, Jehovah, will take care of me. So the theme, I think, is fairly plain. Dwell with the Lord, seek his face, and you'll be hidden in times of trouble. Uh, look at uh, Psalms 31, just a page or two later, I guess. 
<clears throat> Let's read verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Psalms 31. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net, which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Verses 14 and 15. My times, sorry, but as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, we'll come back to that so later, I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Verses uh, 19 and 20. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. You shall hide them. Same theme again. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. So here the psalmist talks about his confidence in God. God is his rock. Uh, the implication sometimes is like flood waters streaming by and you're in danger of being drowned, carried away by the flood waters, the dangers. But if you can climb up into a high rock and the waters can cascade below you, you're, you're fine up there and enjoying the sunshine, right? Maybe a little bird for company, parrot. Flying by stops and keeps you company. You look down at the water, the floods, the danger, but you're in a rock, a high place. You've got refuge. And it says in verse 20, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. Right? Look at Psalms 32, so just a bit later, verses 6 through 11. <clears throat> For this cause, everyone who is godly, that would be us, wouldn't it, shall pray to you. In a time when you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters or danger, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. And then God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which are stubborn, or very often stubborn, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they'll not come near you, right? So God says he will instruct and, and direct and, and guide us in times of trouble and floods to safety. Verses 10 and 11, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright, in heart. Right? So, you know, God is, like it says several places there, a hiding place, a refuge, a high rock in times of trouble. The psalmists understood that. We could look at, you know, a few more, but you see the theme popping up here and there, that the, that the psalmists see God as real. And in times of trouble and danger, they can run to God. They can seek refuge with God, uh, right? They can be protected. They can hide from the troubles with God. And uh, it is good to run to God. They seem to know that. Not sure we always know that. I mean, ideally, of course, you dwell with God in his secret place, under his shadow, and that's a choice, right? It's, it's not automatic. Psalms 91 is a, a great psalm of protection and blessing, but it's not automatic. Just because you keep the Sabbath day doesn't mean it automatically applies. Just because you keep the holy days doesn't mean the psalm applies. Just because right, you do anything doesn't mean the psalm applies. The psalm says in verse 1, to him who dwells, resides, abides in that secret place of the Almighty, 
right? That's the one to whom the psalm applies. Does the world around us dwell in God's secret place? Well, of course not. <laughs> Does the church? Hmm. Does the church of God dwell in the secret place? Some, yes, and some, clearly no. And you can see that if we turn to, let's say, Revelation chapter 2, look a couple of places in Revelation looking at the seven churches in Asia, which we looked at not too long ago. Remember, uh, sort of, uh, it's perhaps somewhat speculative, but there are seven churches that uh, the book of Revelation is written to out of the two dozen, three dozen, four dozen churches that existed in Asia Minor. And we did say that it does appear to fit that each of those letters is to one of the seven consecutive years leading up to Jesus' return to the earth. Right, but anyway, that's beside the point. Just mentioning that in passing. So Revelation 2 and verse 4 is addressed to the church in Ephesus. So verse 4 is talking, so here's Jesus, it's in red letters in my Bible. He's writing a letter to the brethren, the believers in Ephesus. And he says, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. So if you've left your first love, are you dwelling in the secret place of the Most High? Are you abiding under the shelter, the shadow of the Almighty? Well, not if you've left. If you've left your first love, then adios. You've gone out the door and away. So that's the problem, which you know Jesus then reprimands them and rebukes them for. Well, look at uh, chapter 3, addressed to the uh, Laodiceans. Of course, we know that's not any of us. No, no, no. Um, but I think that's the seventh year, as we said some months back. But looking at verses 16 through 20, and the question is, uh, does the church automatically dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty? Is that automatic? Because you keep the Sabbath or keep the holy days or don't eat lobster and pork? It's not automatic because look at verses 16 through 20. So then, says Jesus, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, you know, proud and arrogant, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be, if you like, genuinely rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So the next verse tells us the, the answer to our question. Are, are these believers? Are they dwelling in the secret place of the Most High? Verse 20, behold, says Jesus, I stand at the door and knock. <laughs> if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. <laughs> so this bunch, whoever they are, right, they don't dwell in the secret place of the Most High. They're not abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Jesus is knocking at the door, let me in. Hey, open up, open up, let me in. I want to dine with you. I want to sit with you. I want to fellowship with you. But he's, he's locked out, right? So quite clearly, this bunch, so the Ephesus group, uh, the latest in group, and some of the others as well, they don't dwell reside, abide, have a close working relationship with God or Jesus Christ, right? So they fail, verse 1 of Psalms 91. So let's go back to the psalm. If you've got your marker there, <clears throat> let's read, uh, that was verse 1, all about dwelling, abiding in the secret place, which the psalmists frequently refer to. Verse 2, I will save the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. Now notice, I will say. So the teacher here, I will say. I will speak. And that suggests speak out. Loud speaking right? I will save the Lord. He is my fortress, my rock, my protection, all the rest of it. 
I will say it. So that's, that's like a confession. That suggests, you know, speaking out loud. It's a statement of faith of the psalmist. I'm going to say this, right? Now, obviously, you know, we, we believe in our hearts, right? And, and we, we say with our mouths, right? Uh, we often say, you know, faith is found in two places, in the heart and in the mouth. Now, the problem, I, su I suppose, with many of us is we believe it. We might believe that, right? In our hearts, we believe that. Because of my refuge, I believe that. But we don't say it. And yet the blessings here are to the man who, who says, I will say, God is my refuge and my fortress. I trust him. I will say it, right? Now, if, if we say something out loud, we actually use our mouth and our tongues. Well, if we say that, well, God, God hears it. We hear it. And we hear ourselves might reassure and, and reinforce it in our minds. Uh, the angels hear it. Any demons that are nearby hear it. So there is something about saying something out loud that, that changes it from being just an internal, quiet belief. So you could ask the question, we'll come back to it later. Would anybody ever hear us say that? Right, not necessarily your spouse or your dog, but you know, would anybody, if there was a demon making his way through your house in the coming week, uh, would the demon hear you say something like that? Would an angel hear you saying that, or is it just something that you know, we keep in our hearts and we don't actually say it, right? And of course, you can see there that this person who says this says, "God is my refuge." He is my fortress. I trust God. Says it out loud, but clearly putting his trust in God. Do we? I mean, uh, or do we have a tendency much of the time, other than dire emergencies, to put our trust in people, organizations, institutions, right? Ministers. Look at, we're in Psalms, look at Psalms 146. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses uh, 3 through 7. <clears throat> Psalms 146, verses 3 through 7. Uh, verse 3, I guess, is almost in a sense the key one. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. Don't put your trust in princes. Uh, when I'm praying to God, I usually replace that as and politicians. Don't put your trust in princes, in politicians, in world leaders, right? Mostly because they're hopelessly corrupt Unloaded. or hopelessly incompetent. One of the two, right? Both. And probably both, right? So don't put your trust in these people. They've got agendas, right? They are biased in their own way. They may well despise you, look down on you, not be interested in your problems. Do not put your trust. That's, that's, that's a valuable principle. Do not put your trust in princes, right? whether it's Joe Biden, <laughs> Nancy Pelosi, the hypocrite Boris Johnson, the nincompoop Justin Turtle, any of these people, right? <laughs> uh, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there's no help, because even if there's something they could do for you, even if in some specific instance they could be of some help, verse 3, his spirit departs for his breath, he returns to his earth, in that very day, his plans, projects, thoughts perish. Because <laughs> even if you found somebody you could actually rely on a little bit, the odds are they'll die. Well, not no odds, they will die for sure, right? <laughs> Just might die before your plans have come to fruition. Verse 5, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help. Now, that's different, see? Whose hope is in Jehovah, his God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps the truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed. We have to be patient, but there will be justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Jehovah gives freedom to the prisoners. You don't trust princes, politicians, world leaders, institutions, organizations, media companies, right? Because although they might now and then, somewhere along the line, get some limited help, it's limited. And very often, of course, these people 
even with the best will in the world, they, they die, and that's the end of the help they may have been thinking of giving you. But put your trust in God. Oh, the Creator, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, who, who lives forever. That's a different kettle of fish, right? Um, and clearly the, the, the man or woman of Psalm 91 says, God, the Creator God of heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them. He is my refuge and my help. That's where he looks, right? That's a far better place to look. If you turn to Psalms 71, Psalms 71. And read verses um, 1 through 3, I think. Psalms 71. In you, O Jehovah, in you, O Jehovah, I put my trust. I mean, that's, it, it crops up all through the Psalms. I think one of the benefits of reading the Psalms, which I don't do enough, uh, is that it's a different mindset you come across in the Psalms. You, you know, I probably you know, see things in the media and the TV, newspapers, hear comments from politicians and, and uh, talking heads, as they call them, and all that sort of stuff. We're bombarded by worldly views and worldly thoughts we're left to our own devices but the psalms present a very different type of mind right and you can see here just today how much various psalms talk about looking to god as refuge as help as a place to hide right as one who delivers in you O jehovah i put my trust let me never be put to shame deliver me in your righteousness cause me to escape Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. You know, other translations of verse 3, the Amplified says, You are my rock of refuge in which to dwell. Dwell, we've come across that already. Rock of refuge, uh, the... Uh, C-E-V, that's the common English version, I think. Be my mighty rock, the place which I can always run for protection. Now, psalmists appear to have that mentality. God's real, and he's a real rock, and he's a real refuge. And they run to him, right? Not, not from him, or ignore him, until an emergency arrives, which I suspect is what a lot of people do. <laughs> you know, Pay no attention to God from one week to the next, but along comes an emergency and whoosh, they're there, barraging God's doors. Pay attention, help, help, help. Who am I? Oh, it's me, you know, Brother Jamie. I know I've not been around for a while, but I need your help now, please. Right? Now, God might be merciful, but <laughs> he might say, well, who are you again? Right, Psalms uh, 91, back there. Let's read the next few verses. So verses 3 through 6 which we've read already, so let me just make a couple of comments in, in passing. Surely, says the, the teacher, surely he, God, shall deliver you from the snare of the trap of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Well, a fowler is one who goes after fowls, you know, birds. So puts traps down to, to catch the birds and so on, right? Uh, and, and clearly the picture is of someone after us, like a fowler, well, the one you can mostly think of, I guess, is our adversary who goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we can certainly see that as a reference to Satan, the devil. But God will deliver you from the snare, the trap of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth which I guess the Bible, shall be your shield and buckler to preserve you. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. And of course, <laughs> things always look worse at night time, don't they? Um, if you're at home on your own and there's dark and knocking noises in the window, and like, <laughs> what's going on there, right? Uh, daytime is like, oh, fine, no problem, but nighttime... You should not be afraid of the terror of, nowadays we could probably say the terrorist, because there's plenty of those out and about. You know, they get involved with you know, bomb blasts, uh, gun attacks, 
nowadays more commonly in Europe. You know, they, they get vehicles and they drive them at speed into crowds of people and so on, killing you know, 5, 10, 20, 30. Um, so terrorists, is a, it's not a new phenomenon, but the last two or three decades, quite a number of deaths caused by terrorists. Verse 5, you should not be afraid of the terror or terrorist by night, nor of the arrow, nowadays perhaps we'd say missile, that uh, flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks again in darkness. And of course, we've, we've like I said, we've got the monkeypox now, right? We've had the, uh, the, uh, the uh, coronavirus, right? Um, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. That could be nuclear, but not necessarily. But it shall not come near you. So, wow, that's great. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. So you can see it. It's quite close to you, but you're not going to succumb to it, right? Uh, so that's, that's great news. So you can see here the, the references to protection from bomb blasts, from terrorists and terrorism from pestilence and, and diseases and epidemics and pandemics. That's why people call it the psalm of protection. Some good stuff there. Provided you're the person in verse 1 who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, right? Um, now notice verse 4 there. We'll come back to this in a couple of places. He shall cover you with his feathers. Oh, has God got feathers? <laughs> and under his wings, God's got wings. Shall you take refuge? Well, the, 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 the picture there is a picture of, of what you know, a mother bird might do, like, say, a hen uh, who's got little chicks. And uh, when the mother bird sees danger, perhaps a fox heading towards where the, the birds are, maybe up in the sky, a hawk sort of looking around for some grub, and the mother hen you know, makes a sound and the little chicks come racing and hide under the mother hen's wings. That's the story there. He shall cover you with his, with his feathers. Under his wings you shall take refuge. It's a picture of the maternal protection even of a bird towards its, its young and, and God's that way. I think we have a picture we can sort of show here. Yeah, there you go. That's a mother hen. Is that two little chicks there? Across the mothers. The oh, some, of, some on the right as well are there. I can see a white one in the middle the and a sort of a blackish one I think it is on the on the. the left as I'm looking at it. So there's a mother hen uh, protecting her chicks. That's what, that's what mother hens do. And, and the scripture here says that's what God does. Right? God is like a mother hen protect. I mean, it's God that designed that. Right? And it's a, again, looking through the Psalms, it's a fairly common picture that's on the forefront of the minds of the psalmists. Look at Psalm 61. And I suppose my concern would be that, that, myself included, we perhaps don't often think of God as our protector in a meaningful way, right? And yet the psalmist is the forefront of their thinking. So Psalm 61, verses 1 through 4. Uh, Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. So we put a bit of a, you know, emphasis on this. From the end of the earth I'll cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. So it's that same picture. I mean, probably people in these days who had you know, cows around them and donkeys and, <laughs> and birds and chickens and hens and whatnot, they saw these pictures, you know, day in, day out, little birds scampering under the mum's wings for protection. They saw that. I mean, unfortunately, I'm a city dweller. <laughs> I've never been that close, really, to, uh, to animals. I've seen them occasionally when I've walked in the countryside. I've been to the zoo, whatnot. Right, but I don't have the picture that people growing up with chickens and hens and birds and sheep and goats and cattle and so on around. Uh, so these pictures you see occasionally are, are, are helpful. Uh, and, of course, you know, Jesus used the same picture probably because he'd seen it growing up as a young man in Galilee and Nazareth and down at Capernaum and so on, and probably because he was familiar with these passages and Psalms. So look at Jesus' comments in Matthew 23. 
So Matthew chapter 23. And verses uh, 37 to 38. <clears throat> Getting towards the end of Jesus' physical ministry before he was arrested and crucified and so on. Uh, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. I mean, that's so ludicrous. Who are they stoning? <laughs> They're stoning the ones that... God as Jesus sent to Jerusalem to deliver them. So God's sending messengers to the people of Jerusalem saying, repent, change your direction. I want to preserve and protect you. What they do? They stone them. Stones those who are sent to her. How often, says Jesus, I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. And 40 years later, Jerusalem would be destroyed. Desolate, right? But it says there, you know, Jesus says there, how often in his former life as the, as the Word, capital W, as the Jehovah of the Old Testament, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you... We're not willing. Jesus wanted to do it. Jesus desired to protect and preserve, secure, look after them. They weren't willing. Their choice, right? So let's again have another look at that, that picture. There you go. That's what Jesus wanted to do to the people of Jerusalem. Like a mother hen protecting her chicks, Jesus wanted to do that. The chicks in this case <laughs> were useless, right? And paid no attention. And you can't do that. I mean, any chick who wants to be independent in the real world of hens and chickens, right? When, when, when the mother hen sees the, the hawk in the sky or senses the fox heading towards it, she'll make her sounds, come on, guys and gals, under my wings. And any sensible chick races to get under the wings where the mum can provide a bit of security, right? Any chick who wants to be independent, nah, sorry, no, I, can, I can handle this fox. What? That buzzard? Not a problem to me, right? I've done some jujitsu, right? Well, I'm going to say they're toast, but they're not toast, of course. But they're dead chick, right? So any chick who wants to refuse the protection that God's designed into the system is a stupid chick and probably a dead chick. And it clears a lesson there for you and me. If we ignore the protection that God's making available, his wings stretched out under which we can shelter. If we want to ignore that and say, well, I could do it, you know. I've done a course how to protect myself from harm and difficulty. Well, fair enough. <laughs> but it. don't be surprised if you end up like a dead chicken, right? Um, and perhaps we spend more time in the Psalms, getting the, sort of the, the mindset of the psalmists and, and seeing God again and again referred to as refuge, protection, security, deliverance and safety, it might help us, right? So looking back at Psalms 91, I guess we've got to turn back there. <clears throat> nope, we're not turning back there. But looking back at Psalms 91, I think our memory is good enough. <laughs> the first part of it, there's a, clearly a reference there to understanding that God is offering protection, all right? Because the first few verses talk about God's protection from, from uh, uh, terror, from pestilence and pandemics, from uh, noonday destruction. All right, so there's uh, many references there to protection being available. And we saw in verse 2 the necessity of saying it. I will say, the Lord is my protector, my refuge and my guardian, okay? So it's probably best to have the mentality of recognizing God as protector and also doing what it says there, saying it, right? You believe God is protector and you say it. Faith in two places. What we used to talk a lot about, you know, the heart and mouth connection. Faith in your heart and in your mouth really requires both uncomfortable perhaps for us because we're not necessarily very good at that. I think many of us believe things in our heart, 
mm, mm. not going to say it out loud. But the psalmist, I will say, God is my refuge, my rock and my protector. I'll say it. I believe it and I'll say it. And that is actually scriptural. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. If you turn to 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. I'm going to read verses uh, 13 and 14. So 2 Corinthians 4, 13 and 14. And in the earlier verses, which we're not reading, uh, Paul's referring to the difficulties he and his crusade team were experiencing at that time. Um, they were hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, right? It had been a difficult experience they've, they've gone through. Uh, and he could have said, well, that's it, giving up. I didn't, I didn't bank in all this opposition as one of God's apostles, right? But verses 16 through 13 through 14, verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. Believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. So what Paul's saying is that even though they were going through these trials, uh, this opposition, these difficulties, perplexed, hard-pressed and so on, he believed that they'd be delivered. And so he spoke. You know, in italics there, verse 13, in the Old Testament, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. So in other words, he's implying that the spirit of faith means that you will speak what you believe, right? If you believe, you're going to go under. We're going to go under, folks. Okay, Barnabas and Silas, we're going to go under. This is our last message anywhere. We'll be dead by the end of the week. If you believe that and say that, the odds are it's going to happen, happen right? But here, Paul says, side. we'll be delivered. We're going to fight again. We're going to be victorious. We're going to conquer. We've got more to do. He believes that and he says it, right? And that's what the spirit of faith is. Faith in two places, in the heart and in the mouth. Heart and mouth connection. And of course, that means at the same time that you don't necessarily get swayed too much by what you see. The opposition, the perplexity, the, the being cast down, all that sort of stuff, or whatever is in your life. What we see is temporary. It can change. So whilst we're in this chapter, we may as well just read verses 16 to 18. Again, something we've been over many, many times uh, in the past. Therefore, so still the same theme. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing with the opposition, the perplexity, the difficulties. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are not seen, which of course are invisible. For the things which are seen are temporary, meaning subject to change, but the things which are not seen, God's promises and deliverance, are eternal. So he just Finishing off that passage there saying, you know, we have a, an affliction, but it's a light affliction and it's temporary. You know, these things change, right? So he's not looking at the physical opposition, the difficulties. He's not maximizing them. He's speaking out in faith. We believe we'll be delivered, protected, guarded. We'll be victorious. And we say it, right? And we look at the things which are not seen. Because things which are seen things around us, these are temporary. They're subject to change, right? They can be gone tomorrow. That's the sort of attitude that, 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 that you know, Paul had. So back in Psalms 91, the psalmist says, I will say, right? And when he says, I will say, God's my refuge, God hears that. Angels who are nearby would hear that. The spirit realm, demons who are nearby, the devil, if he's nearby, would hear that. That's a good thing to hear, right? What we do know is he said it because he said, I will say the Lord is my refuge, right? right? 
Now, we may not always be you know, completely aware in our lives um, that saying things is important, but quite often we're quite good at saying negative things. <laughs> and they come right? to pass. And then very often they come to pass, and we don't always realise that, you know, uh, we were tenants, it's just human beings. We have a tendency <laughs> to say things out loud which are the wrong things to say out loud. Negative. Rather than saying, God's my refuge, God's my protector, I will overcome this with God's help. We tend to say things like, well, that's it. I'm going under. There's no hope. This is the last, my last day on the earth. I'll be dead tomorrow, right? Uh, God, you've helped me in the past, but I don't believe you'll help me this time, right? Um, oh, God, where can I go for any help? And God says, possibly me, right? Um, and of course, if we do things like that, then we've, for we've forgotten what the psalmist in Psalm 91 knows. I will say, God's my help. Right, so again, Psalm ninety one is is not automatic. Just because you're a commandment keeper doesn't mean necessarily it all just happens. Right, uh, the psalmist knew he had a place of refuge. He believed it, and he spoke it. I will say, God is my refuge. Let's go back to Psalms ninety one. Psalms ninety one. If you still get your marker there, let's read verses uh, nine through thirteen. <clears throat> because you have made the Lord who is my refuge even the most high your dwelling place dwelling place no evil shall befall you nor shall any plague come near your dwelling for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. So here's some good benefits, right? To the one who's made the most high his dwelling place, right? Now, just in passing, it says verses 11 and 12, he shall give his angels charge over you, verse 12, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You might recognize that. <laughs> that phrase there is quoted by the devil. When Jesus went out to the wilderness for 40 days and was tempted by the tempter, the devil came to him and, and took him up in a pinnacle in a high place on the temple and said, jump off, let's see you float down because it is written, Jesus, that he shall give his angels charge over you. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So the devil quoted that from Psalms 91, to Jesus. Bit of a gall, of course, but that's what he did anyway. And Jesus said, you know, clear off. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Right? Because that was misquoting it. It's, it's not talking about deliberately jumping off a high building, <laughs> seeing whether God will bring you down softly and slowly. It's talking about, you know, an accident of some sort, like the, the day that, uh, you know, Paul was bitten by a snake. Lands in Malta after shipwreck, snake bites onto him when he's gathering you know, uh, twigs for the fire. And all the people in Malta say, oh, he must be a wicked sinner. He's going to swell up and drop dead now because Paul didn't. Oh, he must be a god, right? That was a, a, an unfortunate accident to be bitten by a venomous snake. So you'd be protecting things like that, but not, not deliberate. So what the devil is doing there is, is taking the scripture out of context. It doesn't mean tempt the Lord to keep you safe when you're being an idiot. Right? It means if inadvertently. But one of the, the sort of side lessons here is the devil quotes scripture. Right? The devil transforms himself into an angel of light and his ministers likewise. So just because somebody comes to you and quotes the scripture does not mean they are God's messengers or God's servants or God's ministers. The devil Satan himself quotes scriptures, and believe it or not, to Jesus Christ himself, to the Word of God. <laughs> I mean, the, the you know, gall, I could say, of Satan doing that. But to you and me, just, just bear in mind, when you hear God's Word being preached, that doesn't guarantee it's honest or it's from a man or woman of God, because Satan, the devil, can do it himself. 
Verse 13 says you shall tread upon the lion, the cobra, the young lion, the serpent trample underfoot. That's probably referring to the spirit realm, um, the demons and similar, because Jesus said at one point to his disciples, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. So, you know, scorpions, serpents, lions, uh, cobras, right? These are spirit references to spirit beings, right? So doesn't mean you can go to the zoo, jump on a lion, <laughs> kick a cobra around the zoo, right? Because if you do that, you may well be bitten and die. Like there was, uh, they're American, I've got to say. Don't think we're getting in Britain, but there are some American churches that do throw snakes around. You can see videos of them, right? And they get bitten by snakes. So I'm, I'm impervious because Mark 16 says it'll take up serpents, won't harm them. <laughs> of course, every year, one or two of them, you know, die. They swell up and drop dead because that's not the scripture. It was a bit inadvertent, <laughs> accidental, not, not sticking your neck out. Anyway, so that's, that's that. Um, then the final sort of few verses, 14 through 16, uh, the, the, sp the speaker changes from being the, the, uh, the, the elder advising the younger. And this is God speaking now. So God's heard this discussion, this conversation. Now God steps forward. Verses 14 through 16. Because he has set his love upon me, capital M, therefore I will deliver him. Because... Right? God steps in and says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. So again, not automatic, not just going through the motions. God says these blessings uh, are for the person, the man or woman who sets his love upon God. Not just going through the motions, <clears throat> not doing it grumbling. Oh, I wish God hadn't called me till later in life when I'd had a really good time of fast women and fast cars and all. Why did God call me so early on? Didn't have fun in my life, right? There are people that, that people do what's necessary, people. but with <laughs> it's not it's not done with any real love, Reluctance. right? In fact, we just read that in Revelation uh, 2. They have left their first love. Well, the person here that God's looking at is somebody who sets his love on God. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore... That's why I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. And God's name obviously includes what God is, his nature, his power, his goodness, his patience. To know God's name is to know God, to be familiar with God. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. This is the person who sets his love on God, who knows God's name. At verse 15 again, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. It says with long life, the margin is with length of days. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So what does it mean with long life? I will satisfy him. You know, people say the previous Psalm, three score years and ten or at a push, four score. That's it, right? But we said last week, that's, that's not, that's out of context. This is people under a curse, 70 years or maybe at a push 80. That's not a general comment. Here, the comment is that God, God says to the person who loves him and clearly who dwells in his secret place, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And the impression there is, how long is that? Well, that's up to the person. If they're not satisfied, they can look for more. Right? It's not says that God will decide. It's the person. With long life, I will sat when he's satisfied, when she's satisfied, we're done. If that person's not satisfied, well, ask her a bit more. Uh, Albert Barnes, in his commentary, it's a pretty good commentary, it's free. That makes it even more attractive. But if you buy, if you buy one of these, uh, not buy, but if you have one of these Bible apps. We get lots of translations of the Bible for nothing fantastic, really. But uh, you get commentaries. Adam Clark's commentary is typically free, public domain. So is the Albert Barnes. Albert Barnes says of this verse here, the meaning is, so verse 16, the meaning is, I will give him length of days as he desires 
or until he is satisfied with life. So if one's not satisfied, ask for more. Provided, of course, you've set your love on God and dwell in his secret place, right? Um, so it's quite an encouraging psalm. You can see why you know, it's popular, why people like it. You can see why military men and women who go into you know, grave danger, Jimmy Stewart, I think he had quite a number of missions. He flew over uh, Europe in the Second World War. You can see why people are in danger. <laughs> like the idea of, I think God might look after me. If I, if I honour God and you know, put my heart in God, then so you can see why it's a very popular psalm. All we have to do, of course, is, is believe it, receive it, and, of course, fit in with the description. Do you or I dwell in the secret place of the Most High? It's our choice, right? Uh, and, of course, in part, that requires us to renew our minds. The Book of Psalms is, I think, quite helpful in that sense because we're in the world and we get all the nonsense from the world into our face day in, day out, day in, day out. But renewing our mind means uh, typically spending some time in God's Word, Right. I guess the longer the better. And the book of Psalms is a good place for encouraging us that God is there and God has always helped his people historically. And uh, like we said last week, you know, um, the average American, sorry, Americans, but we don't have the same polls here, but you can I, I, think, <laughs> I think the numbers are probably very similar. The average American spends over five hours a day watching TV or similar, right? The average church goer in America spends five to 30 minutes a day in their Bible. What's renewing your mind? The world, you know, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, or, or the Word of God, right? That's, that's our catch, really. We have a choice to, to renew our minds with God's Word, like what the psalm shows us, and so on. So how are we doing? How are you doing? Do you, do I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, Right? Do we speak out our faith? Well, I say God's my protector. I say God is my deliverer. I say God is my refuge. Oh, you never hear those words out of your mouth or my mouth, <laughs> right? There's an offer here of protection and security and even a long life to satisfy us, right? The choice really is ours. Like I said a couple of weeks back, the clock is ticking. So let's not ignore it. And with that, we'll conclude today's Bible study.